On this Monday, June 13th, we say hello and welcome to Real Talk. Welcome back if you're a regular. And what's up? If you're checking us out for the first time, Ryan Jesperson here with John Hicks. hi yo. You just kind of get let out a big, uh, I don't mean to reveal, I don't mean to pull back the curtain in the first 30 seconds of the show, but you kind of went <laughs> right before we went. Mondays. I just want to check in. You got a case of the Mondays? I thought it's been, it's been a pretty good vibe, pretty good vibe in here this yeah. morning to this point. How are you? You holding it together there at I home? feel like <laughs> he just laughs. I'm not doing anything at home. I'm doing like the basic sort of, I, I, I'm just there to help. Anybody knows... That's the uh, that that's the non uh, essential partner. Well, although uh, Carrie wouldn't characterize me as that, I don't think she's too generous and kind. <laughs> but uh, there's there's not as much riding on my involvement oh, okay. with the with the ten day old at this point than my wife. So I'm just there to provide support. But okay. yeah, it completely changes the dynamic in the landscape at home, and it's and it's a wonderful interruption, and it's beautiful. But it does mean that I come skidding here into the studio every morning. <laughs> How was your weekend? Oh, he's here. It was good. You? Yeah, not too bad. We yeah. kind of kind of laid low a little bit for the most part and just tried to get some sort of stuff done around the house and kind of stay chill around the yard and really enjoy the time outside. A little so. less text from you on the weekend and stuff. I'm yeah. like, I'll just leave him alone. Yeah. That's well, we're just, I think, I think that this summer is, for us is going to be more of a chill summer. Mm -hmm. The schedule's not as packed, although we do have our tickets for uh, coming up. We, we got, we're going to take the family like including little guy yeah uh to the edmonton folk music festival coming oh, up nice. in august oh, which we're excited wait. about I'm so, so we have we have it's that back. circled on the calendar mm -hmm. and i'm actually selfishly using this to tee up positive reflections <laughs> coming up in about an hour there's a festival story in positive reflections we'll wrap the show with it today coming up presented by kubi energy it's kind of cool it's it's justification for you to attend as many festivals as you possibly can there's scientific research finally vindication finally <laughs> Blow all your dough on festival tickets. We'll justify that for you in just a second. Uh, professor Ben Perrin's going to join us in uh, just a few minutes' time. Law professor out of UBC wrote a powerful opinion editorial piece published in the Calgary Herald last week that basically says, I used to, uh, well, what does he say? He says, I used to basically agree with a whole bunch of conservative politicians about criminalizing drug users, but I was wrong. So we're going to find out uh, why the professor's uh, changed his tune. He's the author of a book, Overdose, Heartbreak and Hope in Canada's Opioid Crisis, per usual on Mondays. Now, it feels good to say that, doesn't it, Charles per Adler? Usual. Per usual. <laughs> Charles Adler joining us on Monday morning. He's going to chime in in approximately half an hour time um, from a different Canadian province than last time he talked to us. Oh. The guy's, yeah, he's just making his way around Western Canada right now. And Chuck wants to, to talk about a number of different things, including this January 6th, 2021 committee, these hearings that have been going on in the United States. What insights does he have? What does this mean for Canada? If anything, what should we be paying attention to? Where should our heads be at? That's coming up a little bit later on in the show. This show is presented, as you know, by our friends at Bitcoin. We appreciate their support. And we know it's been kind of a weird past couple of months for Bitcoin. I mean, you talk about politics. Jeez, Bitcoin has been woven into politics, hasn't it, on a number of fronts. And the values have been dropping. The numbers have been dropping. People trying to make sense of it all. You know, we don't sit here and tell you to buy or sell Bitcoin. But what we do tell you is that if you have no idea about Bitcoin or you're looking to learn more, we recommend you check in with the team at Bitcoin Well. You can enroll in their Bitcoin Academy or you can book an online workshop. Plus, you can talk to people face to face like Benny. That's who I go to. You can find them under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. So I took Wyatt shopping over the weekend. He's running some errands with me. He always loves when we can go run errands together. And uh, and we've decided to take something on together. We have planting boxes in our backyard. But uh, oh. typically this has been uh, Carrie's pride and joy in years past. This year she says she's doing all the flowers. She's done all the planters. But these planting boxes, she goes, I don't know if I have the energy for that this summer. She goes, so why don't you take it on? So I looked at Wyatt and I said, well, why don't we try to why don't we try to grow some vegetables? Why don't we have like a little vegetable <laughs> garden, right? We have literally no idea what we're doing. This. So, so we're at the store together this weekend. 
and we're just picking out, and I'm sort of like trying to build a salad in my mind is what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, what kind Tomatoes. of lettuce do we want to grow? What kind of veg do we want to grow? And I'm thinking some bell peppers might be nice. And we're doing this. Hmm. And this, this, this kind uh, lady walks up to us and, and just curious, I think. Maybe, maybe she, she sussed us. She sniffed out that we didn't know exactly what we were doing. Hmm. And she says, oh, kind of what are you guys up to? We started talking. And I said, yeah, we're going to maybe grow this. We're thinking of growing this. She goes, yeah, yeah. I mean, typically... She goes, you want to sort of start those in like the hot house? You want to sort of start those earlier in the year and you want to kind of get those? It's a little late to get to start them. <laughs> well, we don't know. <laughs> but we're going to do our best. We're going to try our best to do this. And so this is going to be our project this summer, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. <clears throat> yeah. We uh we did a garden last summer, me and my wife, at like a community garden. And we were started like... I love those. Yeah, you got to start in like late March, early April, right? And all those showers come. So, Oh, I love the thunderstorm over the weekend, by the way. Oh, Beautiful. isn't that the best? Oh, take a nice nap. Yeah. Oh, I love it. What's your approach when it when it when it really starts to you you said like the nap is the number one move for you? That's oh, the number one yeah. thing you want to do. I'm like, we gotta get home because we were in the river valley and I saw the storm coming and then we saw the lightning. I'm like, we gotta get home. We yeah. Gotta get the blankets out. Yeah. We gotta put a movie on. We Cuddle gotta up. Relax. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Did you did you happen to watch a movie this weekend? I did. What'd you watch? Uh we watched a couple. We watched uh we actually watched it's funny because the real talk golf classics coming up. Yeah. I watched uh I watched uh what is it called? What is it called? The Adam Sandler movie. Oh, it Happy now. Gilmore. Happy Gilmore. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we laughed. Happy that learned one. how to putt. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, there might be a couple quotes, a couple Happy Gilmore quotes on the course on June twenty third, the Real Talk Golf Classic. I might be uh, teeing off like he does. We're pretty excited about that. Can you? Out. You were telling me about something that I don't think has to stay off air. I think this can be an on air conversation just quickly, and then we'll, I know Ben Perrin's ready to rock, and yeah, we'll get he serious is. here. We'll talk some serious business in just a second. Sure, but. But you were telling me that you have procured some hardware, some you procured some equipment <laughs> yeah. for the Real Talk Golf Classic. You and I are going to be set. Real Talk is sponsoring T Box Number Four. We're yeah. sponsoring Hole Four, and you've picked up what are they called? But we have we have to we have to reach with this sound. So I went in. You're to, talking about music, yeah. yeah. And I'll give a shout out. And maybe those sponsors. Long of McQuaid is where I got oh, all yeah. my gear, and I went in and I said, "Listen, we're going to a golf course. I need like five, six speakers. I need the sound to reach." <laughs> And they're like, nope, all you need is two PS-15s. And they brought these things out. And I was like, Ryan is going to love that. These are the heaviest speakers I've ever picked up in my life. But you can turn them facing out and you'll be able to hear us over the whole course. Which, I don't know, is that a good or bad thing? Yeah, no, it's a pretty good thing. The ranch is going to love it. It's a pretty good thing. Oh, the ranch is going to love it. Don't worry about that. So if you know the ranch, you know we're going to be on the fourth tee box and on four... Uh, three hole three is a par three, so they'll be and and hole two is is a nice long track, so they'll probably be able to hear your tunes, our yeah, tunes everywhere on holes two, three, four. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe five. Yeah, certainly it comes back around seven. You'll yeah. get the tee box on seven, and then if we're lucky enough, maybe the sound will reach the par three on eight. Yeah, and if you need a dilly bar shooter, just follow the noise. You'll be able to just follow the noise. Uh, we still do have a few foursomes available. Not many. We're just inching toward that sellout and uh, can't wait for that. That's coming up Thursday the 23rd. Our first guest this morning is uh, a man of deep thought and deep conviction and uh, he evidences that uh, quite often. If you follow him on Twitter, you know this at Prof Ben Perrin. Uh, we're going to talk to him in just a second about his editorial that just ran in the Calgary Herald, he's a law professor, the University of British Columbia, author of the national best-selling book, Overdose, Heartbreak and Hope in Canada's Opioid Crisis. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program, Ben Perrin. Thanks for making time for us this morning. And you're, you're checking in from Vancouver, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Thanks so for so we want to thank you for waking up early for us as well. It's good to see you. We, we, we always sort of gather our thoughts and come together on a Monday, how was your weekend? What does a weekend look like for you and the parent family in Vancouver? Uh, yeah, I, I honestly needed a real break. It's been hard the last few um, months. I've been working on a new project, talking to people who've been horrifically affected by the criminal justice system. And um, that includes people who are victims of crime, people who are uh, offenders have spent you know most of their life in, behind bars. And um, it's just a a project that grew out of this extension of research in the opioid crisis. So I needed a break. It involved jumping in a cold lake, having a campfire and some s'mores. So that was just what I needed. Amazing. And, and your, your, your mind is clear and your heart is full now, ready to face another week. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. 
Ben, it's interesting. Like you, uh, you know, you were you served as uh, former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's criminal justice advisor, a lawyer for the PMO, and it, you know it, the little bits of language that you use and how you use them are telling and interesting. And I wonder if we can maybe even dig into that. You're telling us about this project you're working on. You say I'm talking to people that are affected by the criminal justice system, um, affected by, and then you're talking to, like you said, victims of crime, people who have have survived. Uh, you know, uh, uh, circumstances aren't exactly ideal but at the same time people that are incarcerated people that are doing time people that have committed the crimes affected by the criminal justice system can you take us into that premise yeah i mean i can link it to the the opioid crisis directly too um the fact is that when you look at people who overdosed in in alberta for example uh premier kenny announced last week some statistics which were frankly quite shocking and he seemed to think it helped his argument that we should keep criminalizing people who use drugs he said that 50% 50% of Albertans who died since 2017 of overdose deaths had uh, recently uh, been in provincial uh, custody. So these are people who were in jail. Half of the people who have died from overdose uh, spent time recently in prison. Um, what that tells us is, you know, sending people to prison who have opioid use disorder is like a death sentence. Um, this isn't uh, really news, though, because we actually have known this. Uh, 50% is is extraordinarily high in, in BC. It's 40%. The British um, the medical journal peer-reviewed articles that we had in our research found that uh, people are at the highest risk of overdose death within two weeks of being released from prison. And why is that? Well, there's still rampant access to drugs in, in prisons. There, there always will be, but there's less access. And so your tolerance, if you have opioid use disorder, rapidly declines. About 70 to 80% of people in prison have some form of substance use disorder. And so what that means is when they're released without any kind of supports or any treatment or any plan, and we know this is a chronic relapsing condition, when they do go back to those drugs, I've talked to people who've, who've been released uh, in our research, and they say, I, I used barely anything. One described it as a crime. He said, this isn't going to even do anything. And he overdosed, mm-hmm. and he almost died. And so, you know, we know that the criminal justice system is affecting people. It's killing, it's literally killing people. And it is doing that in record numbers in the province of Alberta. So what are we trying to accomplish with criminal law? I thought it was, you know, trying to protect life and property. And yet we see the system having these these devastating effects. I, it's, it's almost unfair for me to ask you to speak for somebody else. But what do you think that Alberta's premier was trying to say? Or what do you think he was trying to accomplish by invoking that statistic that 50 percent of those that died from drug poisoning in Alberta had been incarcerated within the last two years. What would be the point of a politician saying that? I have absolutely no idea. I don't think Premier Kenny understands the statistics. He certainly doesn't understand the evidence on this stuff. We can look at his opposition to things like overdose prevention sites. We have over 100 peer-reviewed articles saying that these work, that they're necessary for saving lives, and yet he has uh, cut funding and and led, led to shutting them down in Alberta. And there is research now that's come out showing that there are escalated uh, deaths occurring in places like Lethbridge, which has one of the highest per capita uh, death rates from overdose uh, in the country and perhaps even the world. And so, you know, this is this is serious stuff. Uh, Over 27,000 Canadians have died since 2016 of drug overdose deaths. The research is clear. Criminalizing people who use drugs um, stigmatizes them. It contributes to them using alone. So if they do overdose, there's no one there to help revive them. And it contributes to things like people who are experiencing homelessness or using on the street to use faster. If you see the police coming, you know, it doesn't matter that, you know, maybe the police have said, oh, don't worry, we're not going to charge you. But what do the police do? They typically will take the drugs, crush them under their feet. And then someone who's going through withdrawal is going to go back and try to find drugs however they can at that point. That could include petty crime. That could include selling their bodies, this the survival sex trade, you know, just horrific things. And instead, if we look at what why people use, um, the information that we got now is, you know, it's things like early uh, childhood use, early childhood trauma, you know, peer influence, genetics. And, and bottom line, like anyone who knows anything about addictions knows you can't just stop using. That's like the definition of an addiction. So threatening someone with jail time or they're going to take their substances, that, that doesn't stop people from using. It just causes them to use more risky and contributes to their death.
Mm. We've we've been talking about this on the show for people that are maybe just dropping in on this conversation, wondering about context. The province of British Columbia has essentially secured a a temporary. What do we want to call it? Like a, a, a relaxation of or an immunity from what's the technical what's the legal phrase, Professor, from from the government of Canada? Yeah, it's an exemption. An so exemption. There, yeah. So there's a you know, it's a crime to possess uh, any quantity of so-called hard drugs. So things like heroin or fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, cocaine, methamphetamine, MDMA, all this sort of stuff. I, I didn't know anything about any of these drugs. Okay, I'll tell you, I didn't. All right. As far as I understood was, you know, alcohol and cannabis. That was about it. I had to learn about this stuff. And it sounded scary. And one of the things I learned, though, was that fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid, which is driving the opioid crisis, it's found in the vast majority of toxicology reports post-mortem is it's a synthetic drug it's made in a lab and so i did some more digging and it was actually it's an old drug it was made in the 19 late 1950s and why do they create this thing it was for palliative cancer patients it's for people who are dying it's to relieve their pain and it's used widely now in veterinary settings in medical settings i went through a medical procedure where i was sedated uh, a couple years ago after i wrote this book overdose and uh, I asked them as I was going under, I said, hey, what are you giving me? And I just was curious. And they said, well, it's fentanyl. And I was like, oh, OK, well, I guess I got my chance to try fentanyl. Yeah. So I've tried fentanyl and, uh, you know, in a medical setting. And I'll tell you why it's it was completely and totally safe. There's two reasons. One is it was of known uh, potency and contents, like literally they're being titrated by the drop. Right. So that's number one. Number two is there was someone there who knew what to do if I was given too much that could revive me. It's totally safe. Both of those things are missing. We have people overdosing and dying. So the toxic street drug supply is wild west. When I interviewed undercover police officers and vice squads who go in and do these busts, they literally found kitchen blenders being used to mix in fentanyl, which is toxic and deadly to someone who's an occasional first time user when you're talking about a grain more or a grain less of sand that's the quantities they're mixing it with this kitchen blender so zero quality control and you never know what you're getting and it's contaminated we've we've found fentanyl in every i shouldn't say we i don't go test them but the police do drug buys they go undercover and test the drugs they've found fentanyl in everything that you can buy on the street it's not like oh i was just looking for ecstasy or cocaine it's the chances are there's probably some fentanyl in there too because it's cheap it's potent and that so when we lose the the ability to know what's in our, these drugs that people are going to use anyway, it is like playing Russian roulette. And again, when you criminalize something, you encourage people to use alone. And uh, when they uh, they do, you know, relapse if they're even in recovery, and there there's the stigma around I can't you know use again, and the secrecy around it. That's when people die. We have people who died in recovery centers that were abstinence based recovery centers because they didn't have any other kind of support, and they. They had the weight of their family and everyone saying, yeah, you can do this, you can do this. And and they when they do relapse, they die. And the reason for that is because, again, their tolerance has gone down and they're just not able to process that quantity of drugs. And if you've got car fentanyl, I mean, people can Google that and learn about that, which is just like what do you want to call it? It's like turbo fentanyl, quite frankly. And, and, and then people will make these arguments for safe supply, right? Which yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a completely different conversation than what we're having. I mean, this all needs to be kind of one big conversation, doesn't it? Like federally and then by the provinces or, 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 or I mean, I'm just even keeping the conversation to Canada right now. I mean, this is a problem around the world, the opioid is, crisis yeah. and the drug poisoning. You know, you, t- you talk to even people on, on like the law enforcement side when it comes to customs, when it comes to trying to keep this stuff out. The, the majority of it, or at least a lot of it, coming from China. I remember talking to someone from Cal- Canada Border Services quite some time ago, and they said one of the biggest challenges about this is that heroin, uh, cocaine used to come in on pallets, right? Like big, huge bricks. Yeah. And, you know, th- th- there's enough fentanyl to kill a thousand people in, in something. The phrase they used, which stuck with me, was, was in a pencil case. You know, they mm-hmm. said that you can import enough to kill a thousand people in a pencil case. It makes it a lot tougher on the on the enforcement side. Um, I, I think it's worth revisiting the political side of this because even and I'll let you make the point, not me. I mean, I'm citing your piece that ran in the Calgary Herald. People can read it for themselves. Ran on uh, June the 8th opinion. I used to agree with Kenny and Poliev on criminalizing drug user, drug users, but I was wrong. Uh, those are your words. Yeah. The Canadian Association of the Chiefs of Police even support small amounts of decriminalization yet here are the politicians chiming in and i want to read just a portion of the statement that was released by alberta's premier when bc made the announcement 
Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it for yourself. If you're listening on the podcast, I'll describe for you. There's this big banner across the top, like almost like a letterhead, but not the not the party's colors of of, of blue. Uh, and, and not I mean, it's 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 bright red and and orange. It's shocking. It's almost the sort of font you'd expect for like a uh, you know smoky says only you can prevent forest fires. Kind of a real sort of crime and punishment type vibe. Uh, the photo behind it superimposed over a photo of a bunch of needles at the bottom of a kid's playground slide. Um, and says the, the premier of Alberta, who resigned a while ago, but still holding office, quote, as a neighboring province, the government of Alberta is alarmed by this announcement to decriminalize. We will be monitoring the situation very closely. I want to state in the strongest possible terms the, to the government of Canada, the government of British Columbia, that Alberta will exhaust all options should your actions cause damage to Albertans, uh, which is kind of an interesting bit of saber rattling. And, and then you've got the, the front runner. Uh, most are calling him the heir apparent. Uh, to the leadership of the federal conservative party, Pierre Polyev, tweeting this in response to the news as well, uh, says Mr. Polyev, decriminalizing deadly drug use is the opposite of compassionate. Uh, those struggling with addiction need treatment and recovery. Drug dealers need strong policing and tough sentences. It's a line that's worked in conservative politics around the world, quite frankly, the crime and punishment yeah. idea, the lock em up idea, the get them off the streets idea. Right. And, right. and your views used to align with that right up to the PMO. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty basic logic, if you think of it, right? If something is harmful to people, we should criminalize it. I'll tell you what, Ryan, that's as deep as the thinking goes in terms of conservative drug policy. Like, there's nothing behind it. And they know that it wins them votes. They not only um, uh, are able to scare people and rile up fear among voters, uh, they stigmatize and demonize people who use drugs. Um, but they even fundraise off it. I mean, there were there's examples in my book of that taking place. I mean, I think it's 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 sick and it's wrong. Um, what changed my views? I mean, what how did I go from that ideology to actually looking at what would work, what would help people? Uh, it was talking to people who had used drugs. It was talking to the police. You mentioned the Canadian Chiefs of Police Association. They now support decriminalizing uh, small amounts of drugs for for possession. So it's kind of ironic that you have a candidate like uh, Pierre Polyev saying, you know, we're going to make Canada the freest country in the world, but he actually wants to criminalize something that the police say should be legal. Like, what? Let's, let's do a double take there. I mean, not all conservatives think the way that Kenny and Polyev do. I mean, the Cato Institute in the U.S. is an example of a libertarian think tank that supports drug decriminalization. They've done that for, uh, for close to a decade now. Uh, William Hague, who is the former leader of the Conservative Party in the UK, supports decriminalizing drug possession. Um, you know, the Fraser Institute published a review of my book where they were offering as strong of an endorsement as they could of, of drug decriminalization. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I talked about 27,000 people dying of drug overdoses, they don't like, you don't check your you know political views and then say whether you overdose or not. That runs the spectrum. So, you know, whether you're a conservative voter, liberal, NDP, green, whatever, you know, you probably know someone who's died. Um, and if we don't start thinking about why these politicians are saying what they're doing, we're in big trouble. And enough people know someone who is affected by substances to, to, to understand that this is not something anyone chooses. And by threatening them with incarceration, by stigmatizing and demonizing them, that makes this worse. We tried Kenny and Polyev's approaches of cranking up penalties. Some countries uh, have life imprisonment or the death penalty for people who who uh, are involved in illicit drugs. You know what the research shows? It doesn't help. It does not deter. Increasing penalties does not deter. But what it does do is cost billions of dollars. So if you like flushing money down toilets, like let's keep doing what we're doing. And we know that um, the cracking down on the so-called supply has actually only made it worse. You know. You mentioned the CVSA, I talked to them as well. There's 1.9 million packages from China coming into Canada every year. Yeah. And they find fentanyl in greeting cards. You mentioned pencil cases, they found it in greeting cards as well, like Ziploc baggies, okay? So we're never gonna find this. Um, you know, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And guess what, if you do, remember I mentioned it's a synthetic drug. You can make fentanyl with college level chemistry equipment and supplies, that's something I confirmed uh, from the uh, Livermore National Security Lab in the States. I actually went online, Ryan, you could do this just for, for your own fun and try to find a fentanyl recipe. I found one in five minutes, not just found one, I verified it was legitimate. And when I called that lab up, 
they verified for me, said, yeah, you could totally use this. You could use legally available chemicals. So if we want to start cracking down on the border and locking up more drug traffickers, like go at it. The research shows that's only going to increase potency and lower cost. So if we're done wasting money and having people die, let's start looking at what the research shows would work. Man, you remember when, uh, what was this? I mean, it was probably 15, 20 years ago. The argument for shutting down the internet was that there was the, uh, what do they call the terrorist handbook? There was a recipe for building a pipe bomb and people just wanted to shut down the entire internet. And right now here we are doing this live streaming and and you're right. And I am not laughing, but I am research. Yeah. Geez, there it is. Ingredients and cutting agents, how to make fentanyl. Wow. Uh, So Ben, like in straight talk, real talk here. Now people are going to say, and these are just average folks. These aren't people that are malicious. These aren't people that, that want to just necessarily lock up folks that need help. But a lot of a lot of just average, you know, John and Jill Q public, so to speak, will sit here and say, but hang on a second, you guys, it sounds to me like, you know, you're you're, you're just advocating like giving up like it like it's harder to patrol our borders. It's harder. To, so we just so we just open it up and just let people use drugs. And what you know, they hear arguments about safe supply. Well, what are you saying, Professor Perrin? You're saying we should just give people hard drugs? You're saying we should just have these lounges or we just go do hard like what it just sounds like sort of like you know, one of the signs as Sports Illustrated would say, one of the signs that the apocalypse is upon us. Like how do you make that message understandable, palatable? How do you make it make sense to the average citizen that, that doesn't do the research you do, that hasn't been in those meetings, that hasn't interviewed people at the highest level that are trying to address this opioid crisis? How, how do you put this at a, at a ground level where the average person can understand what you're advocating for? So I was there. I would start by saying that all of those things you said, Ryan, those were literally the same questions I had. I did not start out researching the opioid crisis thinking I'd be the one here saying we need to decriminalize drugs, have a safe supply and, you know, all that stuff. So I would say uh, check my book out. Like if you're if you're skeptical or if you know someone who's skeptical about the need to decriminalize drugs or provide a safe supply, literally, like you'll see the chapter titles of the book. I got a, I got a copy here. I'll read you just one or two of them and you'll get a sense of kind of I was there. Here's chapter 11 is providing safe drugs, giving up on people. Mm. OK. You know, do supervised injection sites enable drug use? Won't decriminalize and make decriminalization make things worse? Those are chapter titles. So, you know, I I get it. And that's where I was. So I would say walk that road and talk to people um, that you uh, know with some compassion who maybe use drugs and you might find uh, you might find something surprising. The other thing I would say is we need to listen to the surviving family members of people who have died from overdose deaths. That is not what uh, Premier Kenny and uh, Pierre Pauly are, are doing at all. I mean, when you look at the sort of leading national advocacy group supporting um, these these surviving family members, Mom Stop the Harm is the, mm-hmm. the name of them. People can look them up. Great organization. They not only do advocacy, but grief support. They run support groups for people who've you know, lost their, their loved ones. And they are calling for decriminalization. You know, those 27,000 people who died, the law, Premier Kenny and Pierre Pauly have considered them to be criminals. I, I don't agree with them. I, I don't. I say they're dearly, dearly loved people who deserved better, who deserved some compassion and some understanding. And if you had someone in your life who was addicted to a substance that could kill them, threatening them with jail is, is cruel. It is heartless. It does not help them in any way. So we've got to examine our own hearts. We've got to ask, why are we having this reaction? You know, Lock them up, throw away the key, send them to jail. What I see that's just driven by is fear. We're just afraid and we, we don't know what to do. So we come back hard with some uh, some harsh policies and uh, fear wins a lot of votes. It's sad, but it's true. And look, there is going to be accountability uh, at some point, I, I know, for all of the senseless loss of life here. And we're way past the point where people can say, I didn't know. I love that you give us the assignment to examine our hearts. I always envision, I don't know, because we're, we're, we're a dog family. We have, so I do, I spend a lot of time listening to podcasts, doing a lot of my thinking on dog walks. And I, I'm thinking of somebody right now with their headphones in that's walking their dog that's listening to this just in their own thoughts, examining their own heart. You don't have to be up on a, behind a lectern. You don't have to be up on a debate stage, but just to examine your own heart on this like you've done. Um, and it's a powerful exercise. You know, you keep referencing these 27,000 human beings who've lost their lives in Canada to drug poisoning. 
I also think it's worth pointing out that so that's a number since 2016, right? That's yeah. that's yeah. six years. That's not in human. That's not in recorded human history. That's in the last six years. Twenty seven thousand people. Two hockey arenas full. Almost. Let, let's let's put it that way. Uh, you don't let the prime minister up before somebody says, oh, oh, this is this is a, you know, a PMO stat. This is a this is a, a Harper uh, top advisor that, that's gone rogue. And, uh, you know, this is a political exercise or this is a political attack. You don't let the prime minister off the hook. In fact, no. in, in, in your opinion <laughs> piece in the Herald, you include Justin Trudeau's name. Right. You say yeah. you say that's what's wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm riffing here. But my paraphrase is you basically say that's what's wrong with Pierre Polyev, Jason Kenney and Justin Trudeau outside of B.C. So let's take a look at the federal government and what your expectations are there. Yeah, it's you're absolutely right. And in, in my book, I spend more time criticizing Prime Minister Trudeau, actually, at the end than anyone else. Um, I think Jason Kenney and Premier Doug Ford in Ontario, they make some cameos in the book as well. But uh, I did some research into this. We got, uh, I had three cabinet ministers in the end and uh, BC provincial government official. And I mentioned mom stop the harm uh, all confirmed for me in, in confidential meetings they had with uh, prime minister, Justin Trudeau. The reason that he provided for why he would not decriminalize drugs was because of the politics. He's, he'd faced so much blowback when he legalized uh, cannabis and just pausing here to say, we're not talking about legalizing drugs. We're talking about decriminalizing them, which is totally different. It's not punishing people. That's what we're talking about today. But his reasons for not doing it were political. So he's he's just as guilty as uh, as the other uh, people we've been talking about of putting politics above lives, in my view. And when I wrote to his office about those allegations, they never bothered to even reply. OK, so uh, he's on the hook, too. His party voted against a, a private member's bill just two weeks ago that would have decriminalized drugs across the country, which is what we need to do, not just in BC, not just for three years, not just for adults, and not just for a small quantity of, uh, of infinitesimal quantity of, of substances. So, yeah, we need to turn the page on this global war on drugs. And you're right, it is a global issue. Well over half a million people die from drug overdose globally. And the world is slowly starting to get glimpses emerging from the fog of this global war on drugs. And um, people are taking note. I mean, I've done interviews this week with, uh, and last week with, with BBC, with uh, AFP in France and Israeli news network. Uh, this morning there's an article in Wired if people are interested to read it out. Do the research, yeah, look into this stuff. What you're gonna find is that there's no evidence. There's no evidence to back what Premier Jason Kenney is saying on his his ideas about drug policy it's you know maybe he needs to take some time to look into that i've written to him personally about that and i've i'm not going to disparage him although there's a lot of strong feelings i have towards what he's doing because his policies are contributing to killing people um but he needs to search his heart you know and i wrote to him actually he's a professing uh, catholic i am not catholic but i'm a professing christian and i wrote to him on that basis and i have a problem sharing that publicly because he's had an opportunity personally to do it with me and, you know, one of the things it says in, in the Bible is if you confront someone who claims to be following Jesus, you do it privately and they don't, they don't turn, turn their ways. You're supposed to do it publicly. It actually says that. But I called him out on it. And it's devastating to me to see the amount of um, vitriol and hatred being directed towards people who use drugs. You know, I had a real moment when researching my book, many moments that were quite profound for me. One of them was when I, I came across a study that said the most stigma that globally we have for people and in canada they just survey was for people who use drugs those are the people we hate the most that's what stigma means basically social opprobrium right outcast the most was people who use drugs more than people who even had leprosy which some people in some countries still have and so you know as someone who 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 is a follower of of, of christ i look at that and i go he touched people with leprosy you know he had dinners with with prostitutes and tax collectors who were traitors right and the, the 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 finger wagging you know Pharisees and teachers of the law of that day said, who is this guy? Like he spends time having dinner with these people. Doesn't he know who they were? If he knew who they were, he wouldn't have anything to do with them. I got news for for people. If 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 Jesus Christ were walking the face of the earth in flesh today, he would be in places like the downtown East Side in Vancouver. He would be in places like Skid Row in whatever city you're in. He would be there and he'd be also be in our churches, I believe, calling us out for being a bunch of hypocrites for not uh, having softer hearts, hearts of compassion. You know, I'm grateful he didn't pick up stones and, and stone the woman caught in adultery. He told others, hey, if you're with if you're so hot, you throw the first stone. That's my challenge to people. You know, if you think you've never done anything 
wrong or hurtful or harmful to yourself or others, you'd be the one to pick up the first stone of criminalization and throw it at people who use drugs. I can't do that. I step back and I go, man, I'm going to walk away and look at my own life and think about how could we show some compassion and bring some healing for people and not just judge and condemn them. So, you know, some people aren't comfortable talking about religion, but I think it's important because we have leaders who claim to be, you know, a Christian or of other faiths and they rile up voters. And, you know, I've heard people from the pew talk, well, we got to support the right people. Well, you know, this is not the approach that I see as being one of meekness, gentleness, compassion, right? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Are we showing compassion, mercy, when we criminalize people who use drugs? Absolutely not. So I didn't want to interrupt you. One, but I was like, I will listen to this preaching all day. Um, and I'm having like a, I, first of all, do you have to go? No. Okay, good. So my kids burst down the door looking. For okay, breakfast. sweet. I'm here. Great. Okay, perfect. Because, uh, because I, I kind of like you're, you're, you're kicking up a whole bunch of stuff in my brain. Uh, which I appreciate, and I and and part of me goes, well, don't take this too far off track, and then part of me goes, that's kind of the whole point of this show, is to be able to really dig into stuff and really talk about it. And I think of of some of even in in my own life, Ben, and like looking back on some of the, and I've talked about this on the show before, like some of the the horrible jokes I would tell about groups of people when I was young and stupid, and sure. and in high school, and even into university, and the way that I would judge people either extern like outwardly and audibly or not, or internally, or the way that it shaped my perspectives. And I would just sort of, you'd look at someone like destitute, you'd look at someone on the street, you'd look at someone, you know, there was, it was obvious that they used drugs and you'd, you'd you'd sort of like claim this high ground, right? Like this kind of moral high ground, no understanding of trauma, no understanding of the impact of abuse, no understanding about these cycles. Like you talk about of in and out of the criminal justice. I mean, just no understanding of any of it, just this blind, uh, what is it? I mean, it's just this sort of sense of superiority, really. It's this, it's a, it's an egotistical, um, unaware, like it's just a, a, you know, and then the more you learn, I mean, we've even been going through this exercise, I think as a, as a community on this show. And, and I think Canadians in general, uh, with regards to the, to the, the reminders, I don't call them revelations, but the reminders, uh, about the, the Canada's residential schools and, and the mm-hmm. horrific things that happened there. And then we look at the disproportionate number of indigenous people in Canada that are, that are both, uh, homeless, uh, and, and that are represented in the criminal justice system as well. And we wonder why, like yeah. the answer's right in front of us. That's right. right. But at the yeah. same time, but, but it's, but, but we claim the high ground, right? It becomes more about like choices, right? This is what everybody right. talks about <laughs> choices. Some people didn't have the choice. Yeah. And you know, you're absolutely right. Like we want to start looking at who's responsible for what's going on. We should probably be looking in the mirror, mm. you know, what the, the research shows about uh, drug use, let's focus on that. Yeah, there's a direct line from the residential school system to uh, people turning to substances. The research shows that someone who has experienced moderate to severe early childhood trauma, I'm talking about things like physical and sexual abuse, neglect, um, separation from your parents, incarceration of a, a parent, um, experiencing or witnessing family violence. There's a whole list of 10 of these things are called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Someone who's had uh, at least five of those, so kind of a moderate level of them, they're seven to 10 times more likely to develop a substance use disorder, okay? Seven to 10 times more. The average uh, person who attended residential schools was found in a study to have experienced over six ACEs, okay? Hmm. And so that, that draws a direct line. Again, the last residential school didn't close until 1996, and you also, find that there are intergenerational impacts of this and the research shows that and confirms that too and um yeah i mean you you look at this it's not like cry i talk about this in my class i teach criminal law right and i say you know i used to watch star i'll admit it right i was geek i probably still am you don't become a professor without being a bit of a geek right i I used to watch star trek any other trekkies out there okay um there was an episode where it was called the watchers and the idea was that the uh the Federation was would watch these, uh, you know, alien uh, species or, or civilizations to try to study them. And once they got to a certain point, they would make contact. But they were studying them to learn about them before they would, you know, make contact and, and learn their language, presumably in customs and stuff like that. And it struck me once, you know, I was thinking, what if what if we were? Imagine we were being watched, right? One of the things that uh, you know, an alien life form would notice is that some people 
are locked in these cages and other people are free to go about their business. And they would wonder why that is. That would be puzzling, right? That would be kind of, they would want to know why. Why do some people get locked in these cages and they're not allowed to leave? And I'll tell you what they would not conclude. They would not conclude that people who commit crimes are the people who spend time in cages. Why? Because first of all, the vast majority of crime doesn't even get reported. Secondly, there's a massive disparity between who goes to jail and who commits crime. You're way less likely to go to prison if you can afford a lawyer. Uh, I spoke to a, a leading uh, criminal defense lawyer in your province for my recent study. And I, I'm not going to spoil the next book, which I'm writing, but I can just tell you that I heard some pretty shocking, tough, real talk from him about how money gets you off charges. Mm. And that may not sound as a shock to people, but to hear that from a lawyer in the system with dollar values attached to it, I said to him, hey, look, I, you know, I make a pretty good salary. I'm not a super wealthy guy. I live in Vancouver. My money all goes into my mortgage. Yeah. But if, but I'd need to keep my job. If I got charged with something and I got, I got conviction for it, I mean, I'd, I'd lo probably lose my job and may get disbarred, right? So it'd be a big deal. But I said, imagine I take out some home equity and come to you. What could you do for me on drug charges? And he said, well, we have to, you know, X, Y, and Z. And basically he's like, yeah, we would, we'd be able to do something for you. Someone who does not have the means is going to plead out and they're going to get a criminal record. And over time, that's going to accumulate. and They're going to end up going to jail. So, you know, getting back to this idea of being watched by aliens and why are we incarcerating some people, not others? It's not that the people who commit crimes go to jail. What they would conclude is it's a combination of being indigenous or black, poor, uneducated, and having mental health and substance uses. Pick two of five, basically. And those are the people who we lock up in these cages. You uh, are you seeing a difference like in, in, in the lawyers, whether they're prosecutors or whether they're criminal defense lawyers uh, of today and tomorrow versus who maybe you went yeah. to law school with? Is there a different approach or a different perspective that you notice? Well, let me tell you, this is pretty cool stuff. Um, I know two uh, former federal drug prosecutors personally who have quit their jobs because they do not want blood on their hands anymore. Wow. Okay. And this university that I, I teach and, and work out of, UBC, we issued a, a public apology in the uh, ongoing wake of the residential schools um, uh, issue, apologizing for our role as a university for educating teachers who taught in residential schools, okay? That the university saw that it was complicit because it was teaching people who went, worked in these places. I have no doubt that one day this university and others will or should be apologizing for the role of, of graduating thousands upon thousands of lawyers who served as functionaries in the criminal justice system that contributed to these ongoing harms. Uh, it, is, it is toxic stuff. And uh, the way I teach my students now is we start from square one. We learn the law. They learn the law very well. I mean, I used to work at the Supreme Court of Canada. PMO. I, I know criminal law. I teach it. They learn it. They do great on exams, but they don't just learn the nuts and bolts of law. Uh, this year, I taught them all about the stuff we're talking about. We had criminologists come in. We had addictions physicians come in. We had crown prosecutors come in. We had indigenous and black scholars come in. They heard from experts about how the system is affecting people. And we talk about what are some other ways we could do this? Um, and that's what my next project is about. How could we reimagine the criminal justice system to deal with things because we know people harm others we have to deal with that we can't just pretend it doesn't happen but this idea of using punishment and incarceration as our way to solve it it actually only makes it it worse is what we found you should i'm already looking forward to your next book you should see what's happening in our live chat right now i, I was i was uh, neglecting it because i'm just like present with you ben um but there's people testifying here this is amazing there's pe people are people are sharing their own tragic stories of loss um they've lost siblings cousins people are talking about their own personal perspectives how they've evolved i mean you, you you're helping that's awesome move people's hearts this morning and, and this audience does its own thing too i'm just I, I just feel honored and privileged to be able to hang out with this audience every single day uh ben we've kept you so we're closing in we, you and i've been talking for like almost 45 minutes now so i gotta let you go this is i mean time just this just happens like this and it's amazing i wanted to touch on a couple things before we do and i'm so grateful for your time brent whitmire you may know who he is a former a retired journalist let me say he's a university professor just a, a a really thoughtful contemplative guy i think we've maybe touched on this i think you've maybe answered this already but he's watching and he wants me to ask you if the evidence really matters uh on drug policy on criminal justice on decriminalizing drugs does the evidence really matter to the the capital c conservative movement or if the class interests and appeal to be quote tough on crime is too great that they'll continue to pursue failed policy for electoral gain 
I think we've kind of addressed that already. Uh, that's kind of a succinct way to put it, isn't it? Yeah, I think he's hit the nail on the head there. I think it's clear the evidence does not matter. Um, produce the evidence for their policies. That there is none. The evidence is all on the other side. And we're at the point now where I look at things like uh, the example of you know overdose prevention sites. Like I said, there's over 100 peer-reviewed articles supporting um, those that they save lives, that they can be done well, and um, can actually reduce disruption in the community. One of the problems in Alberta was you, you know you have one overdose prevention site and well that's where all the people are going to go and you know Mary Nahid uh Denshi in Calgary had said at the time like my problem wasn't having uh one it was that I didn't have more right you need more places so yeah. it's not concentrating everyone right so just to bring that up well would another 200 or one or 200 peer-reviewed studies have helped convince Premier Kenny what do you think Ryan I don't think it would have you know so we're, we're past the point of this being about evidence it's ideology it's ideology ideology are are deeply held opinions people have and you can't change people's opinions with facts and so what speaks to politicians well you know we got to start to change the needle uh, the majority of canadians now actually support uh decriminalizing drugs uh, i was uh confidentially given some information about internal polling that the you uh the united conservative party has done on uh decriminalizing drug use and so they're polling on this stuff and they're following you know, kind of where their party's going and that there's still a lot of people really, really opposed to it, even though a lot of people kind of support it. So what that tells me, if I kind of put the political hat on, is that people who are supportive of changing the broken way that we're dealing with our a drug policy, um, you know, need to get more vocal. Um, they need to be uh, doing that in all the kinds of ways that people get politically active. And people who are on the fence, I'd really encourage you, this is, a, this is the, a leading issue right now. I mean, this is the number one cause of death in provinces like BC and Alberta, uh, that's that's not like diabetes and, and heart disease. You know, in my province, it, it's killing more people than homicide, suicide, car accidents, and pharmaceutical overdoses combined. combined. Illicit drugs are the leading cause. Combined, if you add them all yeah. up. And so, you know, what are we doing here? Like as a society, these politicians, like, are they just there to collect a paycheck? Like I thought, you know, keeping people alive would be a good place to start. If we had a toxic water supply that killed 27,000 people in the last you know five six years we'd be doing a lot about that well maybe Look unless what, it was on reserves right well great point yeah, yeah. who's dying who's dying who's and, dying you know, right like if you look you, at the if you look at the at, at, at drug poisoning deaths uh stacked up against covid deaths uh the numbers are actually strikingly similar i know you know that yeah, already yeah well, i'm glad you brought that up i mean in bc we actually had more people die of overdose deaths during the, the first uh, lockdown than of COVID. And so, you know, it is true that disproportionately um, Indigenous, poor and, and other racialized folks are, uh, and people who serve time are dying. But it is also true that it is, it, this knows no socio-demographic background. And so, you know, just to paint that picture, I, I've, I've just spoken to family members who were in, like senior government officials federally who, you know, literally went to wake up their 20 something year old daughter one morning and found her deceased. They had no idea she was using drugs. Okay. And so we need to realize that this affects um, all of us in, in, in different ways. And so, yeah, we could keep going on and I'd love to come back on and talk about the next book and, and this topic anytime, because I'm just thrilled that you are tackling this in a real way and that you're calling out um, the garbage that's happening and being, you know, fed to us as policy when it's actually killing people. You know, the last thing I'd say, right, I could go right now, I'm 10 minutes from the downtown east side from my house. I could go and buy fentanyl or car fentanyl, no problem. I would have to look for weeks to find unpasteurized milk, <laughs> all right? That tells me something here, okay? Yeah. You know, like, let's make this safe for people to keep them alive. That's the bottom line. Just let's keep people alive. Then they can get into treatment and recovery and some evidence-based treatment and recovery, not just stop using, you know, more kind of, it's all on you to fix your problem. You know, that's the whole idea about like, it's the same sort of a thing. You know, I mean, I got to be careful in comparing all these, but it's like telling somebody that's living with depression to like, just be happy. Just yeah. fo focus on the positives. <laughs> like, Okay. Yeah. Uh, by the way, with regards to you coming back to talk about your new book, we'll do that tomorrow, whatever you want. Door is always open. Surely on our live chat right now says uh, Professor Perrin needs to come back once a month.
to continue this conversation. Let me ask you, let, let's try to do this in like one minute and then we'll let you go. We've, we've kept you way over our ask and we value your time. Is there, is there anything that sort of raises concern with you or is there, is there anything you're keeping an eye on with regards to how the federal government has approached this decriminalization, let's call it a pilot in BC? Yeah. Is there anything that's kind of, you're going, well, let's wait and see about this part. Yeah, there's, there's four things. One is it should have been done nationally, right? Um, we know that there are people across the country who are being harmed by criminalization of drugs still. So this should have been a national decriminalization of simple possession. Uh, secondly, the uh, BC pilot only applies to people over 18. So if you're under 18, and that's when most people start using drugs, you're still a criminal. So have fun. Uh, that's, that's wrong. Uh, this shouldn't be criminalized for youth as well as uh, adults should be across the board. Um, yeah, number three is it's limited to uh, 2.5 uh, grams, which was set, we've now found out publicly, uh, the federal government said was basically the police uh, said like that should be the number. Instead of listening to public health experts and people who use drugs, you say that's too low, and it's just going to lead to them continuing to be criminalized. And, and it encourages actually more potent drugs, right? If I can carry two and a half grams legally, but if I go over that, it's, it's criminal. Well, then I probably want some more potent stuff, right? So it's creating incentives for that. And then finally, it's got, uh, I call it a zombie, it's a zombie exemption. It's only in place for three years. Yeah. And it can be revoked at any minute. So, you know, Pierre Pollock says he's opposed to this. If he, you know, wins the party, you know, leadership and becomes prime minister, you know, every indication is this is not a, I don't think I'm stretching. You read a statement. I mean, I think every indication is he doesn't support this. So he could revoke it the days, you know, sworn in. So th this is tentative. It's half baked. It's, it's kind of a half measure. It's, it's, politics it's doing the bare minimum that trudeau thought he could do to get away with this and it's it's not enough so you know i i do firmly believe that we are going to see the decriminalization of people who use drugs in our in our lifetime i hope that and if it's not through the politicians because of changing public views I, it'll be through the courts because this is also unconstitutional you can't have laws that are killing people for no good reason that is that is that violates your right to life Professor Ben Perrin, uh, formerly a lawyer and senior advisor to the Prime Minister Stephen Harper in the PMO. He's a law professor at the University of British Columbia, author of the national best-selling book, Overdose, Heartbreak and Hope in Canada's Opioid Crisis. Ben, thanks so much for your perspective. This is uh, a powerful conversation. We're so grateful you've made time to have it right here on Real Talk. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. The comments on our live chat, and I get the sense that we're going to get some emails on this, and we welcome those anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. There's, there's a viewer watching us on YouTube right now using the handle Late Artist, and I want to let you know how much I value your contribution to our conversation today. I've been keeping an eye on it as we've been chatting. Late Artist shares, my, my brother went through rehab twice and overdosed three weeks after coming out the second time because he had to hide it we didn't understand but had safe supply and decriminalization existed for him i know he'd still be alive Whew. i've learned a lot since i lost my brother i 100 percent changed my mind about drugs and decriminalization and of course the audience is jumping to let late artists know how valued they are and how loved they are says, even my very, very conservative Christian mother is no longer in support of criminalizing drugs. And she's a true blue conservative. Late artist says, thanks to Real Talk for keeping this topic up and relevant. It can't stop until things change. Well, thank you for sharing. And we're sorry for your loss. Can I say that we are not keeping this subject relevant? 27,000 human beings with names blood running through their veins and through their heart, just the same as yours, living and breathing until they weren't someone's son or daughter, someone's brother or sister, somebody's best friend in childhood, 27,000 since 2016. Like, that's what makes it relevant, Right. Sharon says, we got to keep this conversation going. Ben is very relevant this morning. She says, Mark says, and Mark's not wrong. He says, I don't think one needs to be Christian to have compassion and to be less judgmental. Absolutely not. But Mark, if you do profess to be a person of faith, if you do profess to be what they would call themselves as a Christ follower, then what does it mean to truly follow Christ? I'm not a preacher. 
But Ben's absolutely right. I mean, I think it's funny that, and, and this is not me piling on Christians. I grew up in the Christian faith. Many of my friends are, are raising their kids in the Christian faith. I've got a lot of respect for people in their faith. That's a personal thing. But let me just point out that Jesus would have been what, what many people of faith, what many right-wing conservatives would sneer away as a social justice warrior. Who do you think is the biggest social justice warrior of all time? Jesus was a socialist, FYI. <laughs> Jesus was not a free market capitalist. And some of you are saying, I'm not a Christian, but I love that message. I saw a comment from Jillian I wanted to read. She says, I remember an African-American uh, voice. Uh, she says, uh, she doesn't say who it was. She says, I remember this quote. They disproportionately lock up our dads and then they mock us for being fatherless. That's powerful stuff. Tracy says informed choice is a luxury for most. It doesn't mean we can't strive to make a difference. Mark Doran, good to see Mark here. He's been an advocate for environmental accountability in Alberta, in particular with uh, Orphan Wells. You've heard Mark on this show before. He says, don't even get me going on white-collar crime, especially in the oil industry, those who regulate it. These people rarely get caged, as Ben Perrin said, right? Another voice. You want to talk about reconciliation? Decriminalization is a radical form of reconciliation. These are great takes. Karen says this is one of the best interviews ever on Real Talk. I appreciate that. One of you, I, 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 I lost the, the, uh, the comment here just because there's been so many, which is amazing, and we love that. Uh, one of you said you've got to listen to the Crackdown pod, and I wanted to let you know, and thank you for late artists for following up, says my brother's name was Obadiah. The Crackdown pod is hosted by a, a remarkable person called garth mullins and if you missed it on our show you can search our archives uh, anywhere you download your podcast you can search on our youtube archive as well it was back on december 10th of 2020 uh, so this show is like two weeks old when garth mullins host and producer of crackdown pod talked to us uh, that was a fascinating conversation so you can search that back on December 10th of 2020. You know what I just noticed, by the way? This is just a, just a quick moment. I, I'm literally just noticing this right now. I'm checking it out on Podbean. So Podbean is one of the ways that people can download podcasts, and it yeah. tracks how many downloads. You can see it here. I just noticed on Podbean alone, Real Talk has 2,998,985 downloads, which means literally today this show will hit 3 mil. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. You gotta send an email to our sponsors. We might three million on Podbean. <laughs> wow! Thanks, Real Talkers. Uh, Charles Adler coming up in just a second. Uh, speaking of our sponsors, show doesn't happen Try without to them. Remind you. That's for sure. <laughs> we went long there. It's like nine twenty-seven, and we're starting a conversation with Charles Adler. Oh my gosh! I know he's not going to care. I don't care. I don't think Real Talkers care. Friesen Brothers, sixteen locations across the province of Alberta. You know that this company was started by the same family that still owns and operates this incredible business. I mean, this is a family success story if there ever was one. Alberta grown, Alberta owned Friesen Brothers is all about putting good quality food on your table. And that starts with their produce. It starts with their protein. It starts with all of the groceries, the dairy, everything as locally sourced as possible. You're going to find it at Friesen Brothers. If you want to check out the specials they have every month, you can check out online at Friesen.com. And don't forget, it's coming up in about two weeks from now-ish. Two weeks and a bit on the first of every month. It's 15% off every grocery purchase of $75 or more at Friesen Brothers, the preferred grocery store of Real Talk. Oh, yeah. Infinity Healthcare is all about family as well. They know that a lot of you are in this so-called sandwich generation. You're still looking out for your kids and you're looking out for your parents as well. And doing that so-called double duty can take its toll, especially when sometimes mom or dad, maybe it's auntie or uncle, maybe it's grandma or grandpa needs a little bit of extra care, right? You need to make sure they're taking their meds. You need to make sure they're eating the food. There may be a meal delivery service coming, but is it getting eaten? I mean, is the cat getting fed? Is the litter box getting changed? Is the laundry getting folded? There's a lot of things to think about. Maybe you're not even in the same city or town. Infinity Healthcare is a personality matching service to make sure that their home care providers are a perfect fit for those that need the help. You can learn more about how they do it, how they match up their clients and their care providers by visiting infinity-8.ca. 
We also want to remind you that Canada's online university is always accepting applications. And and here's the cool thing about Athabasca University. You want to start a program in maybe business? Maybe you want to learn a little bit more about artificial intelligence? Maybe you want to get on the cutting edge of new trends in engineering or medical research or whatever. The sky's the limit. You don't have to wait till the fall. You don't have to wait till January to start your program. They're world-class accredited programs and courses offer you the flexibility that no other post-secondary does in Canada to learn at your own pace on a schedule that suits your lifestyle. Plus, they're one of Canada's top research universities. You can learn more at AthabascaU.ca. And a quick shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. Looking forward to talking to Mike. This is my selfish observation. Personally looking forward to talking to Mike because we got a few problems to solve in our own backyard. Planter boxes. Planter boxes. <laughs> hey, Mike, how can I grow tomato plants in six weeks or less? He might say, well, maybe that's not our exact area of specialty. By the way, a, gr- a great comment from Tracy in the live chat earlier. She heard about our garden box conversation. She mm. says, don't forget at garden centers. She says you can pick up the... Uh, the pre-grown veggies? I was thinking that when you were talking because we had that convo, I think, last week. So that sounds like a smarter so move. even though you've missed, like, the planting phase, you can go get them, like, Just go get them grown. with a head start. Yeah. yeah. So Eden does these edible garden boxes, which I think is a really neat idea, and a lot of people are doing them, including down the street from us. A family turned their entire front yard into plantable, edible garden boxes. It looks amazing. Mm. It's a little bit different than what you expect. Everybody just does the big sprawling lawn. Mm-hmm. And you put in all that extra work for what? In this sense, I mean, you're on trend. You're doing what's healthy for the environment. Good for your family. Good for your bottom line. You want to transform your space, bring it to life. I recommend that you give Mike a call or visit him online today. Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. All right, before we get to Charles Adler, can you tee up that video for me? This is just to kind of set the scene. This this January 6th committee hearing continues down in the United States, and, and, and I want to tee this up with Charles in just a second. But but here's some audio we wanted to play for you. You're gonna if you're listening on the podcast, these these are some scenes from that insurrection on Capitol Hill. And, and then you're gonna hear the voiceover. You're gonna hear the voice of the former president of the United States, Donald Trump. What a stark contrast. Let's set the table for this talk. Yeah, peaceful people, great people, the love in the air there. Never seen anything like it, says President Donald Trump, who could face an unprecedented indictment on criminal charges uh, for his role in inciting that violence, uh, one of the lowest moments in the history of the United States. Charles Adler has lived and worked in the U.S., but he joins us uh, this morning from Canada's West Coast, a regular Monday contributor to Real Talk. It's good to see you again. We kept you waiting for a few minutes. I owe you an apology. That conversation with Professor Perrin, unbelievable stuff. Well, I want to apologize in advance. Uh, I'm uh, with you right now. He would have said uh, broadcasting, but no, I'm I'm, I'm podcasting. Yeah. Podcasting. Yeah. Uh, modern world, flip the page, Chuck. Uh, pro- podcasting uh, from the West Coast right now where everything is a little more laid back. And I was so laid back in the last little while that I forgot to, you know, juice up the thing. So if I uh, if I disappear, <laughs> there's no con- it's no conspiracy here. It's not uh, it's not it's not globalism. It's none of those things. And by the way, uh, great breaking news uh, this morning uh, with uh, Ryan Jesperson, Real Talk. Jesus Christ is not a free market capitalist. I didn't know that. Nobody knew that. Ryan Jesperson did the scoop. He did the investigation. He's the one that made the declaration. It's breaking news today, right now. Jesus, not a free market capitalist. I, I feel like it needs to be said a little bit more often. I, and and, I'm not, and I'm, I've said on this show before, Charles, profit is not a dirty word, and I'm not anti-business. I am a small business owner myself, but I think more people need to recognize who Jesus would be rubbing shoulders with if he was walking planet Earth in 2022. Well, I've been pro-business all my life for a real simple reason. 
without business, my family would have starved. So it's not very complicated for me. Um, I guess in political terms, uh, you know, pro uh, pro pro business and also pro being decent to people, whatever whatever mm. category they want to put that in. But you know, even from an economic uh, perspective, if you, if you do if you want to put compassion aside, because sometimes you talk compassion, and people just immediately switch off, and they think that you're you know running a, some sort of religious organization. It is not in the interest of the country economically. Okay, it's not in the interest of our communities. It's not in the interest of anything to have twenty seven thousand people dead of opium overdoses, of opiate overdosing. The opiate crisis is real. And the idea of just kind of shoving it, uh, trying to shove it down the drain, just as people were trying to shove COVID down the drain for the longest time, saying, oh, it's only old people and it's only people who are going to die anyway. Oh, sorry. I mean, y- you've got to deal with facts. Ideology doesn't replace uh, facts. And I think sometimes we get into these uh, rabbit holes about who's compassionate, who's not compassionate, what's Christian, what isn't Christian. So I agree. Jesus uh, Christ was not a free market capitalist, but I, I'm not one of these people who, who says that you've got to believe in, in Jesus or any other kind of faith in order to do what's practical. We're supposed to be a practical country. It is not practical to have 20, 27,000 people dying of opium. Nailed it, Charles, and uh, I appreciate you picking that one up. Uh, I know that you've been watching, like a lot of people, I mean, a lot of Canadians, it doesn't matter to us that this is happening stateside, but uh, you know, you've got this this January 6th hearing. I'm curious for your take on it. Why don't we tee it up? Johnny, can you grab me uh, Representative uh, Thompson's clip? This is, the, this is the chair of the committee, all right? He's a Democrat. I'm going to play uh, a quote later from Liz Cheney, a Republican as well. I mean, they're going across the aisle on this one, obviously. Uh, but, but here he is. This is Chair uh, Benny Thompson just a short time ago. I'm Benny Thompson, chairman of the January 6th, 2021 committee. I was born, raised, and still live in Bolton, Mississippi, a town with a population of 521, which is midway between Jackson and Vicksburg, Mississippi, and the Mississippi River. I'm from a part of the country where people justify the actions of slavery, the Ku Klux Klan, and lynching. I'm reminded of that dark history as I hear voices today try and justify the actions of the insurrectionists on January 6th, 2021. It's pretty powerful stuff, Chuck. Uh, I uh, have a hard time believing uh, that we're living in a world right now where so many people are in denial of facts. A few moments ago, we we mentioned the the, the opiate epidemic. Okay, so um, there are, I would say, a minimum of 50 million people it, that, that's a conservative number, possibly higher, who don't think that January 6th was a big deal. So a professor by the name of Moynihan, who became a, a senator out of New York a number of years ago, said, look, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. It's factual. It actually happened. that There was a coup. The president inspired it. The president motivated it. The president wanted it. The president was even okay with lynching the vice president of the United States. So to me, it's tragic that we actually need this committee to put facts on the table. But there there is almost nothing new that's being said here. But now I think, I hope, I pray, okay, that people are paying attention. Why do you think, like, like for the the average American, do you get the sense, like, there's still... uh... I don't know. I mean, I, I would think probably on a partisan side, if you're a partisan Democrat, you're going to have a real problem with it from the beginning. Uh, if you're outside the United States, you probably watched aghast. I'll never forget January 6th watching here in studio, just sat here and watched live on the I, I was just like my jaw on the floor. I mean, it was just unbelievable what was happening. And then you've got this, this Republican Party kind of split in two. It's actually a bigger picture. I mean, you and I could really get into how a lot of the conservative movements around the world are actually kind of split in two, which is pretty interesting. But you got Republicans like Liz Cheney as an example, an obvious one, because she's co-chair of this committee. But then you got other Republicans that, that are still doubling down on this. I mean, just watch Fox News. Watch how Fox is covering this thing, Charles. I mean, they're not even taking commercial breaks anymore. They don't want people changing the channel. They're, they're switching away from video. They don't want people watching the actual video of Capitol Hill being compromised. Why is it so important? You think that anybody's going to change their mind on this at this point? 
Uh, I have, I have, I have no idea. I just have a hard time understanding. Uh, you know, my, my 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 level of understanding of social psychology probably isn't what it should be. But it's amazing to me how multiple millions of people who desperately want to believe something will believe it in spite of evidence. I mean, today, you know, you, you talk to, on any given day, you want to talk to the, the people who have a, their, the best possible handle on politics and, and what would happen if there was an election today. And it's the Irish bookies, okay? It, it still is. The Irish bookies right now are betting that nobody has a better chance of becoming the president two years from now than Donald Trump, Yeesh. regardless, regardless of everything that's happening here. I mean, some people would say that based on what we already know, he should be at Leavenworth. He should be in a penitentiary. He should be locked up. Uh, you know, here's the guy who always talked about how he wanted to lock up other people like Hillary Clinton. I mean, they made a lot of money talking about lock her up. People were buying lock her up buttons and lock her up T-shirts. They ought to lock Donald Trump up. But instead of locking him up, the Irish tell me, the Irish bookies tell me, he's got the best shot at becoming president. So, you know, I, I throw my hands up. I don't understand much of this. I don't even know what. I I, I can't even wrap my mind around. I feel like I have a, sick, a pit in my stomach thinking about that. Um, you were in touch with us uh, just a short time ago, uh, and I know that the uh, – the, I, I, you know what? Can I just say, you and I have always kept it real. I just, I'm like about to like be a broadcaster and sort of like the, you know, the tragedy in Uvalde, Texas, and just like sort of talk about it. Like it's just this, like, oh, let's just talk about 20 children being murdered in their classroom. I just, I can't even, you know what? I want to check myself from time to time. It's, it's not just like keep another, real, man. Keep yeah, it, it's not just real, another story. Family. It's, it's, it's horrible, but there have been dozens of mass, there, Charles, there's been like 15 or more, and it's tough to keep track. That's the tragedy. Yeah. That's one of the tragic elements of it is that from the last time I checked, there were more than 12 mass shootings since Uvalde, but it's probably 20 now. Uh, it's just, it, it's mind-boggling. And uh, how, may, what, 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 how this has just poisoned the United States, this, this sort of gun culture. And I almost, part of me goes, well, why are we even going to talk about it? Because what's even going to change? And that's probably the worst part about it. I didn't mention the teachers that were killed, by the way, as well, and the families that are forever absolutely demolished and destroyed. But you were in touch with us. Uh, privately, and you made an observation to me. You said that that movement on this. You said the U.S. is making snail-like progress on this, but but I suspect also. I mean, with Sandy Hook ten years ago, with Columbine ten years before that, like, are, are you even surprised? Like, what do you what are you looking for on this? Well, you're absolutely right, though, Ryan. I mean, uh, let, let's put all the the, the pompous, old fashioned broadcasting aside here. Uh, this is bullshit. Uh, this is the world coming to an end. When you have as many mass shootings as you have days of the week, I realize not all of them get the coverage that a school shooting gets, obviously. But, you know, anything four or above is considered a mass shooting. You've got one basically every day of the week. When that's allowed to continue and you still have multiple millions of people, just like you have multiple millions of people who want to vote for Donald Trump, like right now, you've got multiple millions. When I say multiple, I'm talking about tens of millions of people who believe it's not a gun problem. It's a society problem. It's a God problem. It's a door problem. It's a whatever. When you have that many people who are still that deep into the glue, you do have a national problem. And you can't just discuss it in old-fashioned broadcasting terms. Somebody, somebody has got to get a hold of people and shake them up. Because right now, you cannot even get consensus on making sure that AR-15s aren't sold to anyone age 18. They're trying to get the peanut moved up the hill a little bit, get people, well, at least we ought to have a law that nobody under 21 can get an AR-15. What the hell is this all about? Why should anyone be able to get their hands on an AR-15? Why are we still saying it's not a gun problem? This is the only society in the world where you've got shootings. Yes, everybody in, everybody in a country like Switzerland has a weapon. We understand that. Uh, it's, it's because of conscription. It's the military, and everyone is told to, to have one. Almost everyone in Israel has one. We understand what the issue is over there. But you don't have school shootings in Israel. You don't have school shootings in Switzerland. You don't have these mass shootings on a regular basis anywhere in the world. You don't have them in Russia or Ukraine or anywhere. For God's sakes, what's it going to take for Americans to understand that this is a serious problem. The other day, 
an American I know who happens to be a senator out of uh, South Dakota, and ordinarily an intelligent guy, blah, blah, blah. I always have to say that, ordinarily an intelligent person. And he said, what is the point of doing anything right now or trying to do anything right now when over 20 million of these AR-15s are out there already? Charles, it looks like did we just lose his video? Maybe this might be the, oh, we got you back. I'm glad because I wanted to ask you real quick. By the way, this is developing. So people that hear this in the evening will have probably already heard it. But if you're watching or streaming audio live right now, uh, the prime minister, Justin Trudeau, has just tested positive for COVID for the second time. That's kind of an interesting story that we'll follow. Um, I wanted to ask you big picture about the about the health of Canada's job market right now. I know you're keeping an eye on this sort of post-COVID. Uh, people are going to email me pissed off that I said it like that. But let's say as we emerge from COVID, it's still obviously an issue. Uh, Still, obviously, people are being hospitalized. Still, people are dying from COVID-19. But as people start to shift their mindset to this new reality or to endeavoring to get back to normal with regards to Canada's economy, there are some encouraging numbers. What's catching your eye in particular? Well, what's catching my eye is we're down to about 5% for unemployment Mm -hmm. uh, without getting into the weeds of uh, economics and policy and all that broadcasting stuff. <laughs> Welcome to the broadcast. Right. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I just want to say that when you're at five percent, that means that just about anybody, just about anybody, who wants a job can find one. I'm not saying they can find the greatest job in the world. I'm not saying that the job they're going to find is going to pay them six figures. That's not my point. But everybody in this country, just about everybody in this country who wants to work, can find a job, and that includes Alberta, where for the longest time, you know, there'd be this asterisk. Because uh, oil was 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 down to you know just a few bucks a barrel, and now it's over a hundred dollars. Even Western uh, Canada Select, it's it's up over a hundred dollars a barrel. So you've got a situation where virtually everyone in the country, including Alberta, uh, can find a job if they want one. To me, that's a big deal, and I know it gets dismissed because we've got high food prices and gas prices and high inflation and the possibility of recession, possibility of stagflation, possibility of a lot of things. The markets are getting trashed today. I get all of that. But I think it's a very big deal and people ought to ought to bookmark it in their brains in any society, any part of the world, at any point in history, when virtually everyone who wants to find a job can find one. That's a big deal. And while I'm not into this, let's let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate this. and Let's celebrate. No, that, that that's that's not real talk. Let's just think about that and take it seriously. Yeah, well, I mean, you just gave us five other things to keep an eye on, including inflation and other things that are that, that give us reason for concern. But you're right. It's important, I think, to balance out the conversation. Uh, I saw a statistic over the weekend. I wish I could cite the source. Uh, but but it, but it showed that if interest rates continue to rise the way they are w- within the next year or so, one in four Canadian families would have to look at uh, one in four Canadian homeowners would have to look at selling their place. Uh, and so this is something that, I mean, with regards to employment stability, it is a big deal. And I think that it's an important one to focus on. Well, when it comes to economics, uh, maybe it's just uh, I'm an old fashioned, you know, bread, bread and butter uh, Canadian. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've been in situations and I've seen situations uh, where uh, people have to make uh, changes in terms of their home, uh, changes in terms of where they live, uh, cut back on this and that. All of that is very, very painful. But there's nothing, nothing more painful than not being able to find a job. Uh, and I, I shouldn't have to explain that, but I think there are many people who haven't lived through those eras. And I can just tell you, Ryan, uh, being an eyewitness to history, okay, that's the worst. Not being able to find a job is the absolute bottom of where life gets. He is the Titan of Talk, and you can catch him Mondays here on Real Talk. We're grateful for it. Charles Adler. We'll talk to you again in a week, my man. Thanks a lot. You got it. Uh, I had mentioned Vice Chair Liz Cheney, who the Republican who's who's vice chairing this committee, this January 6th committee. And uh, I was like, I felt like we were in a race against the clock. I didn't want Chuck's uh, tablet or phone to die on us during the interview. Uh, but I do want to play her voice as well. It's, sure. it's important. I mean, this is uh, so you have, you know, Representative Thompson, who's chairing the committee. He's a Democrat. Here's a Republican voice. Same spot. Tonight, I say this to my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. Finally, I ask all of our fellow Americans, as you watch our hearings over the coming weeks, please remember what's at stake. Remember the men and women who have fought and died so that we can live under the rule of law, not the rule of men. 
the rule of law, not the rule of men. Powerful stuff from Representative Cheney. Uh, as a Canadian, or, or hey, listen, if you're a member of our American listening audience, we hear from you. We, we get emails from California, uh, from Utah, from Arizona. Uh, we've got a couple from Florida, which is amazing. I mean, snowbirds, sure, but still, <laughs> they're down there. We like knowing that real talk's being heard down there. We'd love to hear from you anytime. How are you wrapping your mind around what you're hearing? How are you processing it? How is it? There was an important word that kept popping up in our live chat today relevant how is it why is it relevant to you talk at ryanjesperson.com we'll always leave time to read emails from you from our fellow real talkers coming up in just a second a tradition on mondays we want to make sure we talk about some heavy stuff some serious stuff on the show we're also going to fill your buckets courtesy of kubi energy with positive reflections but before we get there let me remind you that our friends at park power 24 7 are providing electricity natural gas and internet across the province of alberta this is a small business this is a family-owned business that does the utilities differently than everybody else you can follow them on instagram follow him on twitter they have a great social media platform with some tips on how you can save power. what is going on there's a company that sells electricity that's telling us how to save electricity what <laughs> that doesn't make any sense i like it they care about your bottom line they care about their customers as your friendly local utilities provider you can compare rates today bring your business over to park power and when you do make sure you use the promo code 2022 dash real talk why you know if you're a regular you're going to save $70 off your first bill. I saw that Jill left a comment the other day. She said, I finally switched over to Park Power. Finally did it. She's going to save 70 bucks on her first bill. Speaking of saving money, you know, buying cars, buying trucks, it's a competitive business, right? There's dealerships virtually everywhere you look. So what influences where you go, who you talk to, who you give your business to? It's the customer relationship that matters, isn't it? The trustworthiness of the salesperson. The, the, the uh, intuitive nature of their service staff to understand what the vehicle needs done and, and, and what is maybe something you could kick the ball down the road if maybe finances are tough that month. you got to trust your relationship. We trust the teams at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. It's where we get our vehicles. I was a customer at Sherwood Dodge long before I ever did business with them, and I'm proud to partner with them. You can browse their selection online or go see them in person today. You'll find both those dealerships under the Sponsors tab on our website. Also, big shout-out to our friends at Local Waste. I saw them advertising just the other day that they're, they're busy working on new relationships with new customers in Regina, Saskatchewan. They're always growing their footprint. They're in Sturgeon County. They're doing a whole bunch of work up north. This is a company that has understood the value of keeping it local. They believe as a company that communities deserve better. What does that mean? Better service, better prices, more support for local causes. It's not all talk. You can see exactly what they mean. You can see their proof of performance, their commitment to the communities where they live, work, and operate at localenvironmental.ca. And don't forget, you need to blow off a little steam. They present Trash Talk every Friday here on the show. Local Environmental does. You can send us your email anytime. Get that rant off your chest. You'll feel better automatically, especially when you hear it through our 50,000-watt blowtorch. <laughs> and finally, John, when it comes to the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, yes, yes, I did a yes. DQ run on Saturday night, by the way. I had to check. I was like, please tell me they're open till midnight. Please tell me they're open till midnight. <laughs> they are. And at 11.20 p.m., hooked myself and my loved one up with a couple of blizzards. I didn't step outside my comfort zone. I still went with the drumstick one. <laughs> I thought it was maybe a little late for a signature stack burger, a signature stack burger, but hey, today's a perfect day to go check out that bacon two cheese deluxe. Hey, the, the two cheese deluxe, the mushroom cheeseburger, the loaded steakhouse stacker with that onion ring piled with cheese. And of course, their flamethrower, if you like to bring the heat, you can find those at the Dairy Queens of Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. Well, the first show of every week, typically it's on a Monday, our friends at Kubi Energy g give us reason to focus on the positives, to start the week off on the right foot, to find the silver linings, however you want to put it. We call it Positive Reflections. Why don't we go to school here, Johnny? Why don't we go to class? I love this story out of Westminster, Colorado. We're okay to talk about Colorado again now, right? Everybody's over the Oilers' loss. 
Flames have been on the golf course for a couple of weeks still, now. F- still fresh wounds. Yeah, still fresh wounds. Who you got in the Stanley Cup final, by the way? Oh, come on. It's Tampa. You think Tampa's going to beat Colorado? See my post over the weekend? No, I didn't. You're going to have to kill me from Ozarks. <laughs> like, they're just... Yeah, they're so determined. Three Pete and then get out of here. Let's get someone. Pete and let's then get someone new next. Blow year. it up and let Colorado yeah. win it next year. Maybe Edmonton. Or Maroon's going to win his fifth maybe. cup in a row. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth, St. Sorry. Louis and then three with Tampa. Can you imagine? Corey Perry, his third appearance in three seasons at the Stanley Cup final. Those guys are just all. They're like, let's do this. Let's get it over. Let's retire. Yeah. <laughs> they just have. They can. Just, and they're doing it without Braden Point too, which is absolutely wild. Yeah. Out of Calgary, Braden Point. My buddy Haas trains him. You know. Haas taught him how to skate. That last part's not true. Okay, so we'll talk about Colorado because this is a good news story. This is this is a, a sixth grader at a charter school in Westminster, Colorado. His name is Brody Ritter, and this little guy was having a tough day at class because they were handing out the yearbooks. Do you remember this? They're still doing yearbooks, which I think is cool. It's not all digital. Uh, paper copies of the yearbooks, this glossy book, but guess what? None of the kids wanted to sign his yearbook. Like, zero. And so he actually wrote in his own yearbook, hope you make some more friends. Brody Ritter was mum sought and it broke her heart. And so she went online to a Facebook group for parents at the school and she posted a photo of his autograph to himself. And so word spread as it does when there's wonderful human beings walking planet Earth. And it turns out that a whole bunch of high schoolers caught wind of this. A bunch of grade 11 students. And so they rounded up a huge posse of them. You can see this photo here if you're watching on YouTube. And they headed over to the Academy of Charter Schools and they walked in and they were like, where's Brody? Is Brody Ritter here? And the teacher was like, yeah, he's in the back. And they were like, well, we're all his friends. And uh, and you see they have sunglasses on inside, so they're even cooler, right? And, and they roll in and they're like, yeah, we're here to sign your yearbook. And so he gets dozens and dozens of autographs with encouragement and advice. Some of them even put their phone numbers in there, said, call us if you want to hang out. Nice. A guy by the name of Cooper wrote, I know we don't know you, but I do know you're the coolest kid. If you ever need anything, call your senior friends. They're all going into grade 12, right? So this is a big deal. Hmm. And then, of course, get this. Although I don't want to give. Well, they're young. They're young. We'll give his classmates credit for this. They're young. We always want to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Empathy, compassion, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. When they saw that there were almost 100 signatures in Brody's book, in his yearbook, then all the elementary school kids wanted to sign it. Ah. Ah. Well, now you're Oh, now you're here. But Brody Ritter, by the end of the day, said it was absolutely unbelievable. He said it was a reminder of how special it is to feel loved. All because of Brody's mom. Reaching out and mm. the power of kindness. I absolutely love that story. And we wanted to wrap today. I, I promised you this earlier. I said we're getting excited about some outdoor music festivals this summer. Well, check this out. A new study from Yale University. So you can quote your friends. You can say this is from Yale. You might have heard of it. Proves that going to a festival can actually leave you more connected to humanity and more willing to help strangers for at least six months afterwards. Wow. Yeah, there's a residual effect of going to a festival. More than 63% of people polled by these Yale researchers said that going to a festival had turned into a transformative experience. Why did these psychologists look into this? Well, they wondered if modern day secular gatherings could have the same sort of an impact of the psychological effects of religious gatherings. And they found that festivals that emphasize creativity and community can serve a broad purpose. They took a look at festivals like Burning Man in the Nevada desert. They looked at Burning Nest in the UK, California's Lightning in a Bottle Festival, and they found that people who reported these so-called transformative experiences felt more connected with humanity and were more willing to help distant strangers. They said these mass gatherings have the potential to expand the boundaries of moral concern beyond one's own group. So the next time you wonder if you should hit that music festival, do it. The short answer is yes. Of course, Kubi Energy is installing uh, innovative and uh, unbelievably sustainable solar power systems for commercial, residential, industrial, and agricultural applications across Western Canada. You can get your free quote today at kubienergy.ca. Hey, coming up later this week, you probably saw the news this morning. I wasn't allowed to tell you it when we went live this morning, but the announcement's been made, so I can tell you that the rumors are true. 
Rajan Sani has resigned as Minister of Transportation for the province of Alberta and will seek the leadership of the United Conservative Party. She's going to join us Wednesday morning. That's the same day that Brian Baumler is going to talk to us. The home reno expert, the TV host. Why is he stepping forward to talk about his own mental health? That's all coming up on a great week in store here on Real Talk. Thanks for being part of it. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive producer, Josh Dunford. Technical producer, John Hicks. General manager, Katie Cook Shivers. Account coordinator, Lawrence Derlego. Human resources, Lena Shepard. Website design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, home to Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is the flagship property of Relay Communications Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.